My name is Doug O'Keefe. I co-produce these chats with Christina, who's here, and she's doing the filming for us this evening, and with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The purpose of these chats is to record for posterity the stories of the people who shape our community. I have the pleasure this evening of interviewing Marge Summer. under an hour, and then at that point, we will turn off the cameras and we'll have an open Q&A, and you can ask whatever you'd like to ask. That's when some of the best questions come up. <laughs> well, Marge, let's just start right at the beginning. Please tell us where you grew up and a bit about your family. Oh. Uh, originally, I was um, raised by my grandparents, and I grew up on the north side in Logan Square area. And um, actually, I went to that school that caught on fire, and I can't remember the name of it. Our Lady of the Angels or right. something? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Actually, went there before the fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my grandparents raised us, my brother and I, until I was 12. And then my mother married somebody who finally would take the two kids. So we moved to the south side in. Um, Torrance Avenue, and I went to Chicago Vocational High School. Graduated from there. Yippee! <laughs> and that's about it. Did you know anyone who was lost in the fire at the school? No, no. Uh -uh. That was a little after I was there. So that was young. But I remember. Um, that's loud. I remember uh, when I was on the north side with my grandparents behind our house where we live, there was this big commotion of cars on the streets and there was a German couple that they arrested for because it was from the war and they were spies. And that was like something that the whole neighborhood had to run out and see. You know, it was a big deal. <laughs> do, you, do you know what spying they were doing? For Germany. You don't know. So, was it atomic secrets? No, I wasn't old enough to really <laughs> comprehend all of that, you know. I could care less who they were spying for. <laughs> so. Well, as a youngster, you worked for the local phone company, and you had a very interesting experience there. Please tell us a bit about that. Mm. Yeah, during high school, I worked part-time for the phone company, and then when I graduated, I went full-time. And uh, I had already come out at, when I was at high, in high school at 14. Wow. Um, I met my first girl there. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And of course, my mother found out that I was gay, so she politely asked me to leave the house. And I said, fine. And of course, my darling brother said, you could stay in March, just leave my girls alone. And I said to him, I go out with prettier girls than you do. <laughs> so <laughs> I went for the phone company. And uh, I was always out. I mean, I look at me. How could I hide be, be There's nothing feminine about me, you know. But um, I would have problems at work with the bosses. So then I would find out who their girlfriend was because they were usually married and having girls on the side. So I would make sure I got involved with their girlfriend, take them out for a couple of drinks, take them home, have a little fun, let them go back. And then the boss never bothered me anymore. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> and that was in the 50s, so yeah. I was a bad kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, how did you know that these women would be amiable to that? Oh, they let you know. There was no problem there. How did they let you know? They just say, I'd say, would you like to go out and have a drink? And they'd say, I'd love to. And I said, can you get your boyfriend to give us the money? And they'd say, yep. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's take a step back. You, you mentioned um, your mother didn't take well to you coming out. What was your relationship there? How did that transpire? With my mother? Yes. I didn't like her. See, my grandparents, when my grandmother, uh, her and I, before she passed away, we had a long talk, and she told me that 
when my mother was pregnant with me, my brother was always in, in here, and I was the one coming out, but she had gone upstairs. She was living, I guess, what would be my dad's house, but I never met the man, so I don't know who the hell he was. Uh, she uh, tried to abort me by throwing herself down the stairs. She took hot mustard baths, she beat on her stomach, and when she was going to be, I was going to be born, she went up to the attic and something told my grandmother, who lived just a half a block away, to come over. And she went up there and I was out and my mother was sitting there and my grandmother says, tie the cord, you got to cut the cord and tie it. And she wouldn't do it. My gra if it wasn't for my grandmother, I wouldn't be here to aggravate all of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So I was not wanted to be in with, so I didn't care. When we were preparing for this chat and, and discussing some of the topics, you mentioned Calumet City afforded you quite an outlet. So please tell us about that. How Calumet was that City. Different? Well, first there was a bar on, believe this or not, 99th and the Southwest Highway called Bills, and she was a gay woman who ran a bar, and we were allowed to go in through the side door, and she would put us off as, oh, there's my bubble tea. <laughs> and all these straight people bought it, you know. But we couldn't dance or anything. We could just drink in her bar and have fun. And that got boring. So then I found Calumet City. So State Line was where the gay bars are. And there was the Music Box, which was the women's bar. And right next door was the Ups and Downs, which was later called Mr. B's. And then later on, when the Music Box closed, down the street was our place, which was the best bar, because that was mixed, and I love mixed bars, you know. Well, why did Calumet City have these things and not the city of Chicago? Because they didn't have Mayor Daly out there. <laughs> he didn't like us. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. what, what strong memories do you have of your days in Calumet City? Anything stand out for you that was unique to that situation? Yeah, I met a lot of interesting people there. I mean, people would think I was weird because some of the hookers used to come in our bars because it was safe. They could come in there and have an actual drink and not have to produce, you know? And I would talk to them because they were interesting. You know, most people think that guys go to hookers because they want to get, and it's not that, you know? They want things they can't ask their wife, like, would you put a frozen sausage up my ass? You know, or something like that. <laughs> Or wear a feather and run around naked and yell and cock a doodle doo and the guy gets off, you know? <laughs> and then they call us queer. Okay. <laughs> I'll fight. <laughs> I, mean, I loved it because I learned so many things from these people. They were interested, you know? <laughs> I even have to take a second for that one myself. <laughs> oh. But you, you said that the, the gay scene during your high school years was very restricted. Please tell us a bit about that. It was very hard. I mean, you couldn't get caught, you know? I mean, you had to, be, you had to have a fast car. That's the first thing. If you not, didn't want to get beat up, you had to have a fast car. So I had a GTO, which was pretty fast. And you know, because you know, you pass these teenage guys, you know, hey, let's get them people, you know? And so you had to take off running. You had to be very careful in those days, you know? If it wasn't the mayor's people getting it, it was the teenagers, you know. What was the dress code you mentioned? Oh, you couldn't wear fly front pants or shirts that buttoned like a man's. Mm. So you wouldn't, if you were in a bar, like when the volleyball got raided, we all had to run in the bathroom, turn our pants around, put them on backwards so we could get out, because they'd be standing outside with a flashlight. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that was called male impersonation. Ah. I didn't have anything down there. I wasn't impersonating anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I usually don't wear it in public, you know, I leave it around. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But wasn't it something like you had to have three yeah, items? Three, three items of women clothing, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And that was hard because I didn't like to wear bras. You know, I still don't. My aunt bought me a training bra, they called it, you know, and it worked. You trained them, they stood up, and I didn't have to wear it anymore. I was like, all right, I like this. <laughs> well, please tell us about the Chicago bar raids. You, you had to keep something in your shoes. Yeah, money. 
to bail out anybody that got caught. I was in uh, the Midget Bar on uh, Montrose and Kedzie, somewhere up there. I can't remember exactly where. Mm -hmm. It was on the second floor. You walked in the first floor, it was a straight bar. You went up the stairs in the back of the bar, and there was this room. It was all, just all gay women. And if the cops came, you just go to the window, kick out the screen, and jump on the second floor and take what? off running. You know? But then the cops got wise, and they were waiting down below underneath the windows for you. So we quit going there. So it was hard. It was hard. Especially during elections, you really had to be careful. They take you to State Street with all the hookers and throw you in a cell with the hookers. So much fun. What did it cost to bail somebody out? Twenty dollars. Get back then. Do you know how many of these raids you ended up being a part of? I didn't get caught. Oh. I was a good runner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to spend a night there. Uh -oh. I bailed a lot of people out, but I never got caught because I ran. Or I was smart enough that I'd drive back to Calumet City and hang out there, because it's always safe there. You know, one street is all gay and stuff, and the next street is all hookers. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> well, well. Yeah. Your high school girlfriend, let's, let's take a step back. You, you mm -hmm. mentioned your high school girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You had a very convoluted relationship there. Please tell us a bit about that. Oh. Mm. Well, she was, I met her in high school, and I, uh, we went out, went to 63rd Halsey, when it was really cool, like almost downtown. We went to the movies, and I drove her home while well, I got there, and there was a hail store. Now, I, she was at 40, 43rd and Halsey, and I lived at 103rd, so she said, no, you better stay overnight. It's not good driving home. I went, okay, so I called my mom. I said, I'm not going to come home, and uh, <laughs> that was the end of it. We were friends, you know. But then later on, I would call her up and say, hey, you want to go to the show? And she'd go, no, I got something to do. I'm like, hmm, okay. But in the meantime, she had introduced me to this dyke friend of hers, okay? So I called her up. I go, hey, Ari, you want to go do something? She said, no, uh, Pat and I are, I said, oh, okay. I said, where are you going? She said, we're going to the show. And I said, okay. I said, listen, can you wait? Now, she lived in 63rd, so I drove to 63rd got her car, we drove to Pat's house, I got in the bath underneath the blanket, waited for her. Ari took to the horn for her to come out. She came out and she went, hi honey, and I jumped out and went, hi honey. <laughs> and she called us all kinds of names and never talked to us again, so we went out and got drunk. <laughs> and getting drunk in those days was going buying a bottle of orange juice and a bottle of vodka and sitting in your car, you know. Yep. Good. Tell us a little bit about your uh, work that you were doing at that time for the phone company. It was, I remember when, when we were talking about this, y you had a very interesting system that you were employing there at your work. Oh, I worked on mainframe computers mostly and, and Watts systems, you know, which I don't know if anybody remembers what Watts were. It's a special system that the phone company made up for businesses. And I would have to do research for my boss all the time. And then I'd do it all, and then she'd take it and take all the credit and get the dinner and get the candy and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So they set up a big, big thing that they wanted done. And she said to me, can you do it? And I said, sure. So I did it all. In the morning it was supposed to be due, I called him sick. Oh, pity. She didn't have nothing to turn in. <laughs> she wasn't happy with me. I thought she could at least save the candy with me, you know. What were the logs, though, that you had to maintain at that time? You, you said that you had to log calls or something like this, and people oh, would take your logs. And you had to type, you know, when you were typing, for, for when it was the operator would fill out a paper form, and you had to take those and actually type out a bill from all of those. You know, and then they'd go into another room and they'd calculate what it cost them to do all that. Those were the days, I tell you. That's, oh, IBM yeah. cards were fun. <laughs> <laughs> but your dad had an interesting hobby. Please speak with us a little bit about his movies. Oh, his movies, yeah, well, my stepbrother. I never knew my dad. I loved my stepbrother. I already had him for four years, and then he died. 
but he was a, um, taught himself everything. He only went to the second grade of grammar school, and he was so intelligent. And he taught himself to be a, a photographer and to develop pictures, and he would do trick photography and things that nobody was doing, you know. And he let me in the dark, dark room, and I would work with him. Then he go, he worked in the mill, and he'd go to work. He'd lock it up. Oh, why are you locking it up? I know what's in there. So I thought, hmm. Never lock the door on March because she doesn't <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I found out how to get in. I got in, found the projector, because he would get these guys from the mill that would come and he'd say, when so-and-so would come, he's going to give you four dollars and give him this bag. Okay. Well, I knew there was snow in the bag. And I'm thinking, why are you paying four dollars for Mickey Mouse stuff? And it was silent. It wasn't even sound, you know? So I set up the projector. And I called my brother with me and I said, Rich, you gotta see, you gotta see what I found. We found all those porno movies. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Who was he likening to appear in these? Who was appearing in them? I don't know. They were silent movies, they were horrible. They were horrible. Didn't look like fun to me, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> Mm -mm. Well, you said you're a gay woman and not a lesbian. What's oh, God, don't bring that up. Everybody yeah. hates when I say that. <laughs> but I am. I am a gay woman, and, and I will stand my ground on that. Uh, I have always loved, and I probably have more gay men friends than I do gay women friends. Because I love their company, and they're, they're not drama. You know what I mean? Well, you're drama to yourselves, and they're drama to themselves, but you and me, we don't do drama. You know what I'm saying? Oh, right. <laughs> we have fun together. And I had, in fact, I found a picture of all my old, I call my old girlfriends, and I gave them all girls' names. Don was Donna May, Sophie, because he was Polish, and there's a whole bunch of them, and they're all still alive, and I'm happy. You know? Yeah, made me happy, because they're, they're all over the country now, but I found them all. You know, they're all my girlfriends. Tell us a little bit about them. What about them stands out for you? Oh, the fun we used to have. We'd go to parties. We'd go to straight places. And like this one guy, Don, called Don May, he was a good dancer. So him and I would get up and dance together. Nobody realized we'd be doing a cha-cha and stuff. And he'd say, do you think they're going to know? I said, no, they're stupid. I'm doing the lead. <laughs> they don't know it. <laughs> I'm doing the boys' part, and he's doing the girls' part. We're having a good time. And we come out of the dance room, and they go, God, you guys are good dancers. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't follow. You know, I've never followed in my life, so. Yeah. <laughs> Even now, right, Lorenzo? <laughs> I take my little boys, and they follow for me. <laughs> I just never learned to go backwards. <laughs> and I can't wear heels either. Oh, no. So I can't make Ginger Rogers either. <laughs> How did you enter the bar business? Yeah. Uh, that was a quirk. Uh, at one point, I was uh, working for uh, Rolla Klepek at night. I would oh, be yeah. like her kind of a half assed manager because I was working downtown. Uh, for Shell Oil and computers. And I would get off at midnight, and she said to me, would you mind going in? She had togetherness, which was a great drag bar. Yeah. And she said, would you mind going down and, and just, you know, watching the bar, clock it out, tell me what I need to order, put the money away, you know, and stuff like that. And I said, sure, no problem. So I started hanging around different places, and uh, I ran into a, a guy that wanted to get rid of, um, he had or PQs, it was called, at Clark Canary. And uh, I used to hang out in there. And then I heard that uh, Eddie Dugan was going to open the bistro. And I said to him, you better clean this bar up, because I'm going to tell you something. Right now, you're packed to the rafters. But once Eddie Dugan opens, you guys aren't going to have any business. He said, no, 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 we'll be OK. OK, Eddie Dugan opened. You could go to through PKs with a full stick sideways and not hit anybody. Damn. There was nobody in there. So he got frustrated, and I said, OK, I'll tell you what. I'll run this bar. Let me clean it up. I want to change the name to Miz, which was my initials, and it was that was when Miz started. Yeah. And we could run a cool gay women's bar. Yeah. 
Thank you, honey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. It was a great yeah. bar. It was everybody was welcome. Yeah. And we had fun. We had a ball team. And my daughter was the good luck charm to the ball players. It was a great bar, and when it finally went down, I was sorry to have to close it, but it, it got right to the point where I had to just close it, you know. What years did you have that? 70 to 73. Yeah, but it was, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but one New Year's Eve, after, New Year's Day after the bars, you don't get liquor deliveries right after New Year's Eve. So we were open that night, and we were running out of vodka, and it was about 15 to 20 below zero. And I said, well, let me go down the street, because I knew a couple of the bars on Erie. And the uh, gay boys had a bar, but theirs was closed. So I went to Joanne's, which is on State in Erie. Oh, yeah. I said, do you have any extra vodka? I'd like to borrow some, I'll pay you for it, or whatever. And they said, nah. I went, okay, so I'm heading back to the bar, and I get just to the alley of the bar, and I hear three quick footsteps, don't scream, and I thought, oh no, you're not gonna fuck me in an alley at 50 below zero. You're crazy, <laughs> you know? And I could hear the disco music in my bar, and I thought, no, this ain't happening to me. And he threw me down, and within a split second, it said, get your ass up, March, and I did. And I just kept, he was kept punching me and punching me, and I kept my head about me, and <clears throat> I finally waited for him to, to lose his concentration. He dropped his glove, and when he reached down for it, I gave him a knee and took off running to my bar. Never caught him either. Because when I get in my bar, of course, I was bloody and half clothes were half ripped off of me. And I said, this fucker tried to rape me and I want him. I don't want to kill him. I got my keys to my car, my gun, jumped in my car. Next thing I know, I had four dykes in the car with me. <laughs> and I said, okay, we're going to go look for him. But you're not going to hurt him. Take his pants down. Because I got six bullets for his dick. That's all I'm going to shoot is his dick. <laughs> Nothing else. He won't hurt another woman as far as I'm concerned. Oh, wow. Wow. That took a while to get over. Yeah. Well, please tell us a little bit about the gay scene here in Chicago in the 70s. It was cool. It was cool. I, I mean, liked cool. it. I, see, I don't know. I, I frequented all the bars. I loved little gyms. You know, women, gay women wouldn't go to little gems because it was an all men's bar. They served dirty pictures. I loved those pictures because I made fun of them. You know, <laughs> that was before he had the, the movies. You know, he would show a picture and this guy's thing would be laying on its side. And I went, see, he played with it for so long he broke it. <laughs> you know, but go there in the morning before I go to my bar, and the, the manager and I would just have fun. You know. But I had good times with all of them. We had some neat bars. And, and the, the sad part is there's no more women's bars because yeah. women don't drink as much as men and don't go out all the time, you know? And that's the story, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you've mentioned a couple of times that there were a lot of really neat bars. Which ones really stand out for you? Ah, uh, yeah, Togetherness, for one. That was Raleigh Cleepnake's bar. Uh, that, she had a phenomenal drag show there. Uh, Sparrows, uh, oh God, never go. King's Ransom, that yeah. was another fun, those are all boys bars or drag bars. Gold Coast, I love the Gold Coast downtown. I used to stay there at night with Gary Chichester. We closed the bar and get totally wasted. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I never could end up at a girls bar. I was in a leather bar. <laughs> but, uh, then we had the Swan Club, which was a nice bar, and Ladybug, which is a nice bar, and Closet's still around. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of great ones to go to, yeah. you know. And then we had his and hers. Yeah. Yeah. His and hers came about after the Miz. 
the guy that let me have that bar had a bar on Lincoln Avenue. And the same guy that was running PQs was running that. And it was going down the tubes. I said, okay, let me have that. I'll change it. I'll pay up your bills and I'll take care of it. So he said, okay. So I changed the name to his and hers on Lincoln Avenue. It's now where it says do not enter for the parking lot. <laughs> the building owner. But so it had a little kitchen in the front. And I thought, oh, this is cool, you know. And so we had the kitchen, and I said that my lover at that time was a singer. So we started doing a little bit of music, and Judy Tenuta was one of our first wow. people. Yeah. She finally admitted she started it his and hers. Thank you very much. <laughs> After all the beers, I had to buy for people to stay there so they wouldn't leave. They, they didn't understand her humor. I did, you know. But that's how it started. And then when uh, he sold the building to the hospital, we had to go look for another building. So I looked around, looked around, and I found the one on Addison. We cleaned that up with the help of a bunch of nice gay guys that are, some are here, some are gone. We got that together, and that became the best bar I ever had. Sure was. Wow. When you said that his and hers had the best open mic in the world, why yeah. so? How so? Yeah. Talk to old how the old to old town school of folk music. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Michael Smith and all of them came there and performed. Yeah. You know, and I had a thing. I, I didn't want to discriminate at anybody, but if you wanted to play in my club, you had to do a free gig on Sunday for open mic, so I could hear you. And God bless, they all did it. <laughs> but you know what was really strange is after all of this is done. I'm on the L station, waiting for a train one day coming when I was working downtown. And there's always musicians down there, and it's cool. And if you're good, I will give you money, because I know it's rough being a musician. So I put two dollars in this guy's guitar case, and I stepped onto the train, and he said, thank you, March. Oh, oh my God. So he evidently performed at my club at some point. <laughs> so it made me feel good, you know? What challenges did you have with his and hers? Challenges? Difficulties, challenges, anything that made it interesting to run? Ah, uh, well, the neighborhood was a little like, um, I think the Latin Kings ran that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, when I first opened, um, <coughs> this guy came in and looked around, and I, I called the Patron. He had a coat over his shoulders and a cane, and he walked in and he looked around and looked around. Because when I took over the bar, that Stego paint, Puerto Rico forever and all that stuff, so we got rid of all that. So anyway, he's looking around, looking around, and he goes, hmm, you need protection. I said, oh, from what? You could have a fire. And I'm thinking, oh, no, you're not going to do this to me, really. I said, you know what? This club is heavily insured. Set it on fire. I can get out of this goddamn Puerto Rican neighborhood and get a nice bar. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> and then I have a problem with some of the other boys coming from Little Jim's to my bar. They get jumped by, by the Mexican guys, the kings. Mm. And I had to go out and say, explain to them, look, if you're going to smoke, I'm not going to call the cops on you. But if you touch my customers, I'm going to call the cops. They're not gang members. They're simply gay boys. And the reason they wear leather is because Kremlin wrinkles so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite line today. <laughs> and that was it, you know. I treated them fairly. You don't mess with my people, and I won't mess with you. And, and it worked. We never had a problem. How long did you have the bar? Almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. What made you give it up? The city took it away because I wasn't established. Couldn't be that we did the gay dollar campaign and pissed all the aldermen off. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> and just Mr. Anton Velukas of the Secret Service in Chicago made a fool out of him. Let's explore that a little bit. I did want to ask you about your gay dollars. What was all that? Uh, okay, my buddy uh, Frank Kellis, who ran Gold Coast on uh, Clark Street, I was in his bar one day and I said, you know, they're complaining about the Evergreen Food Store. 
because they wrote a bad article in there about gays. Don't let them sneeze on you, touch you, you can get AIDS, you know. This is when AIDS was like everybody was afraid of it. And I said, yeah, but they're picketing and gay people are walking through. And the gays are picketing and the gays are going and shopping. What's the sense of that, you know? So he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, let me think. So before we close the bar, I said to him, how many people you can get? He said, I think I can get one. I said, okay, me, my daughter, you, and him. Meet me there at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday at the Evergreen. So we met there. Of course, we called Kit Duffy in the meantime, told her what we were doing. Went there, loaded up four shopping carts, heaped to the rafters with everything we could find. And we'd stop in the middle of aisles and stop the Jewish ladies from shopping because we'd be talking and blocking the aisles. And, but I said, no perishables in the car, so I don't want to do that. So we did that, and when we got ready to leave, we parked our carts in each aisle, and nobody could move them out, like, you know. And we walked outside, and Kit Duffy came in, and she said, they will be back every Saturday morning unless you put a retraction in the paper and make a sizable donation to an AIDS organization. And he said, hold on, got out his checkbook, is $500 enough? He said, yes. And back then it was. Yeah. So he wrote out a check. And she came out and she said, okay, it's done. So we thought, oh, that was easy, you know? So we went and had breakfast. And I said, what are we going to do about the city hall bullshit, you know? So I thought about it. We designed a stamp. And we got $17 million stamped. Wow. <laughs> and not a lot of people liked having that money in their wallet. It had to be a red, red stamp. Got to make it red so it shows up, you know. What was the city hall doing that was so bad? I it wouldn't pass the ordinance, state ordinance. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What impact do you feel the gay dollars had for the city, for the community? For I you? I think it helped get it passed. Wow. Because they sure as hell couldn't get it passed. They went babbling, 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 you know. Wow. But. Frank and I both paid for it. He got audited for four years, I got audited for four years. You know, well, you don't mess with the government unless you're ready to take, take the shit they're gonna throw at you. I said, okay, fine, audit me. I'm not doing nothing wrong. But then when it came time that they wanted to make a bigger L, I didn't give me nothing. How did the community respond to the gay dollar campaign? Oh. Nothing. Wow. No. No. Wow. Mm -hmm. But as a bar owner and as thus an established member of the community, how did you confront the AIDS crisis? Mm -hmm. That was hard. That was hard. I lost a lot of friends. A lot of friends. And um, yeah, all you do is let them visit them in the hospitals and, and offer to be help for them, you know. That's all you could do. It was, I mean, I cracked a couple of them in the head at Duches. <laughs> and I said, I hope you have a rubber on that thing in your mouth, you know. I mean, you guys didn't, come on, seriously, you didn't take it too seriously for a long time, you know. But, and then they said, what, they come out with this, Big dental dams for women. Uh -huh. It's like eating a ham sandwich through a plastic bag. No, thank you. <laughs> dental dam. If you don't want to eat it, don't go make sure what's gone in there before you've been there. That's all. <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, you should know me by now. <laughs> I, I can't change. That's it. <laughs> by the way, my daughter is 40. Oh my God. How did you come to have your daughter, Tanya? Uh, when I had the Miz, I, one of my uh, customers was a caseworker, and she said to me, Marge, you know, you'd make a great, great parent. You'd like kids. I said, I do. I get involved with women that have kids. I could care less about the woman. I like the kids. And I didn't like the way they treated them. She said, well, why don't you be a foster parent? And I went, hmm, think about that. So I did. I got four foster teenagers. My first one was pregnant with Tanya. And then I got three other teenagers. So that was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. But they're very troubled kids, you know, and I had problems with them. Um, I really don't want to go into too much detail, but I had to give them back because 
it created problems for me with China. I almost lost her, you know. So, but I kept Tanya. I adopted Tanya, and I kept Tanya in touch with her real mother because I think you should know who your parents were. Not that I ever found out. You know, could have been the milkman, the man, garbage man. Who knows? But I wanted her to know that this is the woman that gave birth to her. You know. Where is she now? Who, Tanya? Yes. In Virginia. That's why I need a copy of this. <laughs> what does she do in Virginia? She plays mommy. She has two wonderful children. My granddaughter is gorgeous. My grandson is autistic and totally autistic. He doesn't talk or anything, so she's got her hands full. But she married a great man. Great. Mm -hmm. I made sure. Whenever she brought him home, mm -mm, not material, that's not marriage material. Nope, that's not marriage material. <laughs> I took him out for her. But she was younger, you know, I said, when this AIDS thing started, and I said to her, you know, you're at that age, you're going to be dumb. She's going to be making it with some boys eventually. So I just brought some rubbers home. I said, no love, no love. Wow. And say, well, you're telling the kids 14. I said, if you think they're not doing it at 14, you must be dreaming somewhere, honey. Yeah. They, we don't do it at 14. We didn't even know what it was all about at 14. But these kids nowadays, they know everything. You know. So I taught her, you know, it's okay as long as you're protected. Wow. How different, uh, rather, let me rephrase that. How have you seen the community evolve over? How different is it now from when you were young? I liked it better back then. It was closer, more camaraderie, more friends. You could walk into a bar and it didn't have to be wondering if you would know anybody in that bar or if anybody knew. I walk in a bar now and they look at me like, what the fuck are you doing here? I said, I'm here to check the bar stool I got for you. <laughs> it's, it's just, that's part of, I guess, growing up. But I liked it when we had our own places and we had neat things. And it's great people found out we had better bars than they did, so now they want to hang out in our bars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about your movie, Crimes of Hate. Ah, that was, yeah. <laughs> Made a lot of friends with that one. <laughs> that was uh, Gary Chichester and uh, Bill Varnadu had lost a friend who was beaten and murdered behind Christopher Street. And there was, they were attacking and raping gay men and killing them. And so nobody was doing anything about it. And the, the, the bars more or less put pressure on the papers. If you produce anything, they wouldn't put advertisement in there. They, the Learner Booster kept putting things in there. So we decided we were going to produce this movie, Crimes of Hate. So we had, we were on Halstead Street, we interviewed people there, and they all admitted that even if they got jumped, they never reported. Everybody was afraid to report. You gotta report. You can't be afraid, you know? Right. And that's the way it started, so. It aired three times on Channel 19. Wow. Mm -hmm. We had fun at the Picture Magic, through all of us on a Saturday morning downtown at Chicago Cable Access. <laughs> <laughs> RJ and Gary Chichester, partner do with me, drunk out of our minds, still in the morning trying to do camera work. Oh my God. <laughs> it was fun. We drove them crazy. <laughs> but you had to take the class to be able to get the cameras out, you know. Oh, I see. And of course, you know, who carried the camera? Yeah. <laughs> Not the big guys, this one. Why were you having to carry it? Because I'm the only smart one. <laughs> No, I, I had worked with cameras before, so I liked it. Yeah, it was interesting. It was a good. I thought it was a pretty good little piece we did. We proved our point. How do you see the community today regarding that violence issue? Is it, is it a better situation? No, it's still happening on Halstead Street. There's still having problems. There always will be. Yeah. I mean, I don't care how many rules and laws you pass. It, you have to get, reach the people and stop pointing fingers at everybody, you know? I mean, if, if, if you take a black man and rip his skin off 
Do you know he's black? No. Do you know what I'm saying? Look inside, not this. You know? And we don't molest children, thank you very much. You need that for the straight boys. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? That I don't have any heart. <laughs> I want you to all know the love of my life right here, Janan. This lady and I met on Facebook. Believe it or not. And, uh, and it was just kibitzing. I was kibitzing with uh, uh, Mamie from uh, Stargaze. Uh, we always keep it on Facebook about certain stuff, and she joined in. I thought, yeah. oh, she's interesting, you know, and uh, we got to talking, and I said, would you like to meet for coffee? She said, I don't drink coffee. I said, well, we can meet for something. I don't know. I was just looking for a friend. I had just finished my bout with cancer. I just got a year clear. Thank you very much. No, I wasn't looking for anybody, because I was bald-headed by then, you know. And I had this crazy hat that my friend Ari, who in the very beginning of my talks was my dyke buddy, she came in from Phoenix, Arizona, and brought this crazy baseball hat with hair sticking up out of it. <laughs> and I wore it in the hospital, and they all thought I never lost my hair. <laughs> and I would get in the elevator and say, good night. <laughs> but um, she's like, well, we could meet for coffee. Well, in the meantime, she gave me her phone number, and I had found out that she had a lover for 40 years who passed away from lung cancer. And I thought, oh God, I have to tell her. I'm bald, I'm gonna meet her. And we're just gonna go for a walk around the lake, which I needed to do, because, you know, I don't know if you know it, but chemo is not fun, right? right. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> it is not fun, it saps the shit out of you. And so I try to walk, I try to exercise as much as I can because I've lost a lot of strength. And uh, I said to her, I don't know, I just want you to know that when you meet me, I'm going to be bald because I've just finished my chemo from cancer. And she said, that's okay. She said, oh, I, I know people that are bald. <laughs> <laughs> so we met and we walked around the lake and we had a nice talk and we parted our ways. And when I got home, it was an email from her, and she said, oh, I won't give you a microphone. Thank you. <laughs> and she said, if you're not really interested, I'm not going to get this right, so that's why you should say it. Okay. Mm -hmm. She said, I have feelings, and if you're not interested, let's cut it off right now. I said, nope, I'm not ready to cut it off, because I think I finally met my soulmate. Oh. Yep. Oh. If you could go back in time and revisit any spot in your history, what would you want to revisit and why? Oh my God. Hmm. I don't think I want to go back there. <laughs> no. No, I mean, it's memories and I liked them, but some of it wasn't good times, you know? I had a lot of rough times in my life. I lost my house. I didn't have a house. I was renting a house in the fire and Thanksgiving. I spent watching it burn down. I had nothing. You know? I had a couple of fires like that. And back then you couldn't get renter's insurance, so everything in your home was a total loss. Yeah, so. Now, I like it where I'm at right now. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, that concludes the formal interview. This lady sure went through everything that I got to